Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the college. The college consists of the following format. First, we'll have a brief announcements period. Then we'll have the speaker who will speak up to about an hour. After that, we will then have a um, question and answer period. We ask during that time that you have questions. After that, our speaker will get the last word. We have to run, run out by, eight, by 8.45 because the restaurant closes at 9. Two rules of the College of Complexes. First is one fool at a time. And second is no personal attacks. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's get tonight. It is uh, Troy Antonio Hernandez. He's running for the Illinois Green Party candidate for 2020. For the, for the MWRD Water Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. Oh, yeah. Let's welcome Troy Hernandez. Troy, Troy. Troy. All right. Well, Boy. thank you all for having me. Um, this is uh, this is exciting. Um, yeah. So let's get into it. Let's get this full screen. There we go. That's the leather. Yes. Um, so let me tell you a little bit myself, uh, about myself. You see that all right? Yes. All right. Um, so I got a PhD. I went to UIC for, uh, I was continuously enrolled for 14 years at UIC. Every time I went to graduate, the, the economy would tank, and I decided I should probably hang out and uh, get more education. So I got a bachelor's degree in philosophy, a bachelor's degree in mathematics, uh, I got a master's degree in game theory and operations research. Um, then I did a PhD in, in statistics specializing in machine learning. Um, shortly after that is the only time I've lived outside of Chicago. I moved to Beijing, China and worked at their most prestigious university, Tsinghua, um, as a postdoc. Uh, and then after about five months, I realized I couldn't afford to live in China. The Chinese academics don't make much. and. Uh, American academics in China make even less. So I came back home, uh, worked in the tech scene. So first I worked at uh, Civis Analytics as a data scientist. Uh, Civis Analytics is a DNC firm. Uh, they do the analytics for the, the Democratic Senate Campaign Commission. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, Vivaki, I uh, worked as, a, as an advertising firm, another data science position there. I worked at Sears Holdings, in old Chicago, I left there. Come on, let's, uh, let's hear our speaker. All right, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, and now I, I've worked at uh, IBM for about uh, three and a half years. Uh, as a, now I'm a solution engineer, but pretty much I uh, show up and explain to executives what machine learning is, what data science is, uh, statistics, and all, the, all this fun stuff. Um, in addition to doing that, I'm a volunteer. Uh, so um, uh, Pero is the, how I got involved with the Green Party. Um, so Pil Pero is the Pilsen Environmental Rights and Reform Organization. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Jack Ailey uh, is, a, is a friend of mine, a, a regular uh, for the Illinois Green Party. He's the one who recruited me to run for this cycle. Um, I help run the Chicago R user group. So R is a statistical programming language. It uh, has become very popular in the last 10 years. Uh, when I started using it 10, 15 years ago, it was a real niche thing. And uh, it's why IBM hired me, because uh, it's a very exciting programming language to work with. So I'm an organizer for that. I'm familiar with uh, the, the struggles of trying to organize, so I appreciate you guys putting this together. Uh, and then I was on the Pilsen uh, Local School Council, Pilsen Academy Local School Council, for four years. Uh, we replaced the principal. It was a lot of work trying to fight uh, the machine and all that, all that fun stuff. But we got a new principal, we got a new playground. It's good stuff. Um, this is a profile picture I used a few years ago, and um, you'll see it's it's moving a little bit. It's animated. Uh, this is. Uh, a fun application of artificial intelligence. So what we do is we train a neural network uh, to, on, on a Henry, what I did was I, I trained a neural network on a Henry Matisse painting, and then used uh, that neural network to recreate my picture in the style of Henry Matisse. And this is how the computer 
I made an animation to show you kind of how the, how the, the neural network, uh, the artificial intelligence, comes about emulating Henry Matisse. Um, so that's a fun application of the AI stuff that I do. I, I actually do stuff that's not uh, as fun or pretty, but usually more important than uh, a fun picture. All right, so the, the, that was the introduction. Uh, here's our agenda. Um, I'll talk about the MWRD real quick. Uh, then I'll uh, talk about, well, I've already talked about myself enough. So uh, I'll uh, explain to you guys our, our two other candidates. Um, then I'll, I'll explain to you why I chose, I chose to join the Green Party. Um, and and this, this second half of the talk is very much, uh, it was a talk I gave to the American Medical Association back in October about organizing and doing environmental justice work that I do with the with Beto. Uh, and it, how that intersects with uh, the nonprofit world and the media and politics uh, is actually, uh, I ran for alderman last year and five years ago and seeing how that all played out has given me some insight into trying to handle uh, get a toehold in Chicago's politics. So I'll talk about the politics, the media, and then uh, what I, uh, I'm calling Troy blindness, and then we'll take some questions. Uh, so the MWRD. Uh, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District is one of the largest waste treatment and flood prevention agencies in the world. Uh, it's overseen by uh, an elected board of commissioners. Uh, it's one of Cook County's largest governmental bodies, over 2,000 employees, and an annual operating budget of over a billion dollars. Uh, so that's a lot of our tax dollars uh, going. And um, if you vote for me, I will be overseeing that billion dollars, at least in part. Um, MWRD is responsible for flood prevention and uh, abatement in Cook County, uh, wastewater and sewage treatment for most of Cook County. A handful of suburban municipalities have their own sewer authority. It's not quite uh, equivalent to Cook County, but more or less it is Cook County. Um, and then some water quality testing in the in the Chicago area waterway system. Um, for more than 20 years, all commissioners elected to the board have been Democrats. Uh, I don't know if you guys uh, eat cereal, but there's a, a Captain Crunch has a, a Captain Crunch variety with berries in it, and people love the berries so much, they um, they created a cereal with just all the berries, and it's called Oops All Berries. This is a popular meme on the internet. Um, we have Oops All Democrats on the, the Board of Commission, uh, and so, you know, for the, the Green Party's whole, whole case, is, it shouldn't be nine Democrats. Uh, this is how, uh, as we've seen with Mike Madigan, uh, and uh, this combat scandal, um, you know, the, the good people of Cook County are, are overpaying in taxes and getting underserved. Um, so we're running a, a full slate of three candidates, uh, all full six-year terms on this unified platform, uh, prioritizing uh, flood-preventing infrastructure. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that later. And governmental reforms to end the entrenched culture of pay-to-play politics and cronyism. Now at my two and a half hours of driving today, I was not able to uh, put those slides in, uh, but uh, we, you can sure enough go to uh, illinoisunshine.org and uh, look at some of the uh, Democratic commissioners and uh, the candidates they have today, and sure enough, they get a few thousand dollars from engineering firms, and those engineering firms then go to those same commissioners after they give them $2,000 and say, hey, you should hire us. And those commissioners said, hey, you gave us $2,000. You sound like a great engineering firm. We should hire you. And, um, and that's the cronyism. Um, and sure enough, my, uh, my opponents on the Democratic side, whoever they may be, have a good idea that uh, the, the folks that were endorsed by the Cook County Democratic Party and the Tribune and the Sun-Times uh, are all the same three people. So I expect them to be our opponents. And uh, they definitely take a lot of money from uh, people that they, they give contract students. It's, uh, I think it's corrupt. It's legal. It's legal corruption, but it's corruption nonetheless. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later. So the Green Party candidates. 
uh, that's me. You can find out more about me uh, on the website, JoranHernandez.com. This is mostly about uh, math, music, and politics. So obviously I was in the math department for seven years. Um, talk a little, a little bit about data science and statistics. Sometimes I'm not like Noam Chomsky, where like there's linguistics over here and politics is a hobby over here, uh, doing statistics and data science. Uh, raise your hand if you know what data science is. Okay, raise your hand if you know what statistics is. All right, that's much better. Uh, computer science or programming. All right, so data science is just the intersection of statistics and programming. Uh, it's both of those things together. When you automate the machine to do the statistics, you can get a lot of fun stuff done. Um, that's basically how this picture was drawn. So there's some of that fun stuff. I used to play in a band for 15 years touring the Midwest, uh, playing some hippie jam band music. So uh, I uh, got some music on there, and then uh, the politics uh, gets a lot of real estate because Chicago politics is just so entertaining. Uh, that's me, TroyHernandez.com. This is uh, Tammy Vincent. She was unable to make it tonight. She was supposed to make it, uh, but she got pulled into something uh, this afternoon. Uh, she's a CPS elementary school teacher. A member of the executive board of the CTU. Uh, she ran for 28th Ward Alderman about years ago, chair of the Black Caucus of American Federation of Teachers and the CTU, an executive board member of Mother, Mothers Who Care and West Side Democracy for America. You can find her on Twitter at Miss TFV. Um, so you can learn more about her views there in 140 characters or less. Uh, our, the third Green Party candidate who was unable to make it today as well. Uh, she, this is Rachel Wales. She's got uh, her master's in uh, environmental studies and environmental public policy, uh, BA in political science, and uh, grew up in, uh, on a farm in Barrington. She's a Worth Township committeeman, and uh, she's an environmental educator, uh, doing a what, freelance volunteer writer for nonprofit Crate Free Illinois. Uh, and maybe uh, she. Maybe our, our other two candidates will be able to find another time to, uh, to, to speak with you guys. Um, so why Green? Uh, why did I join the Green Party? Oh, this is where I might need, um, let's see, I might need some Wi-Fi here. Oh, we are connected. We're connected to a network. You can probably get on and get, it, get your slides. All right, let's see how it goes. <laughs> All right, so join the Green Party. The Green Party has some really good ideas. If you haven't noticed about uh, the Green New Deal that, that Bernie's been pushing, uh, how many people know that that was a Green Party uh, platform in the first place? Yeah, so that was, that was originally a Green Party idea, and of course the Democrats took it and watered it down a little bit, um, but still a great idea. Well, the same thing happens. The Green Party runs candidates, and then the uh, the Democrats run and say, oh, we're going to do the same thing. Um, so last time it was, and I didn't get this slide in here today, again, two and a half hours on the road, um, but uh, last time the Green Party ran on, hey, we should have an inspector general for that Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, billion dollar agency, kind of a backwater for Democratic uh, operatives who kind of you know, they, they failed some election, or there's, they're trying to move on up, and so they, they get pushed into uh, the MWRD, where they give contracts to folks who uh, give them campaign contributions. And so they called for an ethics, uh, or, or an uh, inspector general, and then sure enough, after the Green Party ran on that in 2018, in 2019, Cook County Democrats uh, put in their own inspector general from Cook County. Um, so. All right, good idea, Green Party. Um, so here's the, the sometimes endorsed uh, Cam Davis, Kim Dubuclet, and Ida Sepulveda uh, for the MWRD and the Democratic primary. Um, and Cam Davis has this really great idea that uh, the MWRD is the second largest landowner in Cook County, and he'd like to see some of its unused property put to use for community farms and stormwater management, especially on the south side. And uh, See how this works. All right, so there's that endorsement. Where's our page up? There we go. All right. 
So this is from the MWRD uh, RD Illinois Green Party site. Uh, this is from 2018. I just got access to it, so I'll be updating it for uh, well in the coming weeks. But if you look at the old the old website from 2018. MWRD is one of the largest landowners in Cook County with roughly 9,500 acres of property, very little of which is currently devoted to flood preventing green infrastructure. Now, oh, you guys just realized you own all this property and we can actually use it and not just uh, lease it out to your friends at a fraction of the cost. That's such a great idea. I'm glad the Green Party thought it up and Cam Davis is now running on it. Um, a Green Party idea. Um, so check that out. Uh, there's another great idea um, from Ida Sepulveda. Uh, she would push for a sensor system similar to one in Kansas City that would provide real-time data on when it's most efficient to open floodgates. Uh, that could reduce combined sewer overflows, which pollute Chicago area waterways in Lake Michigan. That is a great idea, Ida Sepulveda. And yep, you can find that again uh, in this recent um, go here. Uh, so here's, the, here's that endorsement. You can find that there. Um, and here's, so let's look at Kansas City's, uh, Kansas City system here. There's a nice little video. Hopefully it pulls up in, in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, looks pretty slow. All right, so I'll read this while it pulls up. Appreciate your patience. So for, this is from this report from Kansas City. You're looking at the largest smart sewer system in the world that will utilize all of this sensing, machine learning, and optimization technologies to better manage stormwater runoff. Um, so Ida Sepulveda's great idea is to use machine learning uh, to clean up, uh, to, to help manage our stormwater system. Um, you know, it's funny, I have a PhD in machine, machine learning. Where would she get this idea from? Well, in my WTTW um, a voter guide video that I, I recorded a few months ago, I, I wrote and spoke to this, this, as an expert on data and artificial intelligence, I will bring my technical skills to bear on issues within the MWRD. I'll connect the dots between flooding and necessary infrastructure improvement. And so, what do you know? They, they've already, they're already running my campaign. So the campaign that I'm running has already had a great effect because no matter who wins, we're going to have machine learning and IoT. Now we're going to have uh, somebody with no background in machine learning and data science try to tackle this issue. And if you want somebody with no experience in handling data and statistics and artificial intelligence, you should vote for the Democrat. If you want somebody who's a PhD in statistics and machine learning to help run uh, this data science platform, you should vote for me. Um, and that's, that's hosted there. Now just to show you that we didn't concurrently come to the same conclusion, I encourage you to go look uh, at the WTTW website and look at Ida Sepulveda's platform, which if the slide advances, you will see. Uh oh, I might have, may have frozen this. You did. What do you think? Close to your tabs. Uh, I, let's try this. Restart. Yeah, you gotta restart. <coughs> let's try a control alt delete. Blue screen of death. Alright, so. Uh, I'll uh, cut to the chase there. Um, if you go to her WTTW, uh, her platform that she recorded around the same time, but before my, my platform was made public, um, you'll, you'll notice that she says, we already have all the technology. What we need to do is engage the community. Uh, now that she's running against the Green Party and myself and has learned my platform, uh, let's exit pages, how about that? It'll come back up on a map. Technical possibilities are being explored. 
so yeah, if you go to her WTTW thing, uh, let's cancel this. I think we're okay now that we closed a couple tabs. There we go. Yeah, this one's too much. So they just take our ideas. Um, With Donald Trump flash? You can have all of that. Let's see. We got a couple of there too. <coughs> yeah, so this is this is Ida Sepulveda's WTTW uh, thing before she decided to steal my, <coughs> my platform. While we have the technology to tackle these issues, what we need is greater public awareness. Public awareness is not going to give you sensors in the sewers to know where you're running. I, the technology will. We don't have the technology. At least we don't have it yet. Um, so there they go again, stealing the Green Party's great ideas. Um, the other reason I'm running for, uh, as a Green Party candidate, is I am now persona non grata for in the Democratic Party. As I mentioned before, I work for Civis Analytics in uh, the 2014 cycle. Uh, it was my first job out of, coming out of Beijing. I did some consulting. I tried to do <laughs> consulting before then without any connections in the city of Chicago, and that did not work out for me. Um, so I got, I got this job with Civis Analytics. They, they get $4 million a year from the Democrats, uh, doing their analytics, analyzing voter files, doing polling for the uh, Democratic Senate Campaign Commission. Um, they're owned by the chairman of Google, a uh, billionaire uh, who was, uh, he was uh, called out for wage fixing in California. He got together with the chairman of uh, Apple and Amazon and said we're not going to hire and we're not going to poach each other's engineers to suppress wages. Well, after he uh, coordinated with the other CEOs to suppress wages, he then decided he was a really great Democrat too. And uh, so he started. He helped out Obama, and this is how this company got formed after the uh, 2012 election. Is these folks got together, and um, let's see this one come up. And so uh, I got, I was really excited, I'm into politics, and I'm not, I wasn't a huge fan of Obama, I bar uh, voted for the Green Party every time, especially in the state of Illinois, given the Electoral College. Um, this site cannot be reached. I, oh, jeez. Shut me down. Um, so, I started working there, I was really excited, and uh, within two months, the CFO was quoted in an email they sent to me, uh, he was reading... Uh, something in Spanish, and he said, I don't speak poor. What does that mean? And so he referred to speaking Spanish as speaking poor. This is the guy who negotiated my salary with me. Um, and I was instructed to train a couple uh, PhDs um, and a couple master's degrees in, in analytics. The PhDs were, were in physics, which is not data science or statistics, so I had to explain to them some things. I came to find out they were making about 25% more than I was. I have to train them, and they're making more than I am. Um, oh, let's see what else. Oh, uh, another manager called me a fake Mexican. I'm, I'm half Mexican. Uh, my mom's from Bridgeport, my dad's from Pilsen, and um, I, I'm the white boy of the family. I'm okay with that. Uh, my, my siblings teased me enough growing up. I just got all the Irish genes, and now I burn in the summer. It's not that great. but. Um, but uh, he, I, I was explaining I was having some difficulty. You know, we grew up in the suburbs and when they were burning black people's houses down, so we didn't speak as much, as much Spanish in the 1960s Burbank, uh, Illinois, as uh, I think my grandparents would have liked. So I didn't grow up speaking Spanish. Had some trouble working with, uh, on the LSE, all the, all the moms were predominantly Spanish speakers. So now I'm having some trouble uh, with uh, communicating with them and translations are, are tough and blah blah blah. It was a great opportunity to learn and improve my Spanish. Uh, my fiance is Puerto Rican and uh, we have a baby on the way in six weeks, so I really want to um, have our kids speak Spanish. Thank you. And uh, so this guy says, Oh, it's you know, you're probably having trouble communicating with them because of your fake Mexican last name. I was like, What? <laughs> like, this is not how you conduct yourself. Uh, and then I, I, I raised these issues with, with the, the co-founder of the company, a vice president, and she said, we would love to hire underrepresented minorities, blacks and Latinos. Uh, there was not a lot of black. I, I was, they wanted me to be the token Mexican. And uh, I'm only half Mexican. Like, you can't even get, you're too racist to get, even get a, a, a full uh, Mexican employee in a company of 70, uh, 70 people. Uh, all dem democratic firm. Uh, 
Latinos and blacks are 30% of the, the electorate for Democrats. We were not 30% of that company. I said, we got to hire some underrepresented minorities. And, um, and they said, we'd love to hire underrepresented minorities, but we can't afford to train them on the job. And that kind of bothered me. Because it took me a while. She was assuming that all underrepresented minorities needed to be trained on the job. While the only underrepresented minority that was doing training on the job, I was training the white guys. Uh, and so I was like, man, I, I tried to work with you guys. I'm not a huge Obama fan, but, you know, I, um, so I ended up suing them. It's not every day you have an email from a CFO just saying the most racist things ever. Uh, well, sure enough, when you sue a company owned by a billionaire, you're not going to win. And I did not. Um, but after that, I, I uh, you know, still tried to, to work in the, the city's, elect, uh, city's politics. And I, I became persona non grata. And I kind of had this sense, I'm not an idiot. You know, you piss a lot of people off, especially billionaires that run the, the Democrats' uh, analytics. Uh, now, again, the, the chairman of Google now uh, sits on one of Trump's DOD boards. Um, he's a true blue Democrat, except when he's working for Donald Trump. Um, so, you know, there's, a, there's someone similar. So nobody cares about Latinos, nobody cares about black people in, in the tech industry. It's, you see a lot of, uh, we need more women. Uh, so last night I was at a women in data science uh, conference. Women only uh, make up 20% of the tech field. Obviously it should be closer to 50%, so that's a cause I support. And I wish the women in tech would support Latinos uh, and African Americans in uh, tech. Uh, we don't seem to, to get that much support. Um, unfortunately, we only make up we we only make up uh, five percent of the tech industry. All blacks and Latinos combined. Um, so it's pretty abysmal. It's an issue I really care deeply about. Um, but this woman, I don't know if you know her. She sued uh, Michael Madigan's office for sexual harassment, um, and they they settled. I guess she got a better lawyer than me or her opponent wasn't a billionaire, just one of the most powerful politicians in the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois. So she settled with him. Um, I, I did not settle. Uh, I, uh, I wrote this blog post instead, which was more fun. And, um, and uh, yeah, so, so she talks about, she was unable to find a job. She, she was working in the, the Speaker of the House's office uh, for several years, she sued him. Persona non grata, she went back to bartending. Uh, now, after this story's come out, she's got a lot more important friends than I do. Um, now she's finally getting work again in, in politics and doing election work. But I, I have not. So I, the, the Democrats don't want me. And that's okay, I don't want them. Um, so that's, uh, oh, I was supposed to change this slide. Um, so that's, that's why I joined the Green Party. We have good ideas. Uh, and the Democrats, I'm, I'm not a Republican, and the Democrats, uh, they don't want me, and uh, they don't seem to want any talented black or Latino leaders. Um, they, yeah, uh, I'll, they want people to fall in line. They don't like whistleblowers, if, you, if you've noticed that Snowden's situation with the, uh, with the Democrats, or Elena Hampton's situation with the Democrats. They don't like whistleblowers. They don't like me. Um, so. All right, let me back up a little bit. I'm going to talk about here the, uh, the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, in grad school at UIC for seven years, uh, I tried to volunteer when I could, show up as a body uh, in the protests and march, uh, marches, uh, wage some online uh, you know, uh, memes for uh, Medicare for All and these sorts of issues. I attended the marches uh, for, what is it, the G8, G9? Uh, the, the NATO summit back in the day, and so I got involved locally with this group called Pilsen Alliance. Um, when I came back from Beijing, they said, "Hey, Troy, uh, metal dust causes lung cancer." All right, so no, so they said we got a we got a metal shredder that's trying to come into the neighborhood, and um, and we don't want this metal shredder in the neighborhood. And so I looked up the the dangers of metal shredders in the in the in residential areas, and there's one study from Houston, uh, is environmental statistical literature, and yeah, it turns out that metal dust causes lung cancer, and maybe we shouldn't have that in our neighborhood. Um, 
And so here's where the proposed metal shredder was. And see our high school's right there. My house is up over here. It's like, oh, this is, uh, at the time I think I was living over here. Um, it's like, yeah, no, we don't want that. This is the way the wind is going to blow. This is a wind rose. And uh, it shows you where the metal dust is going to go when the wind blows at this proposed metal shredder. Well, I looked into it some more and I said, hey guys, there's an existing metal shredder already in the neighborhood. And it's actually in a worse place than the new one is going to be because the wind blows right at the high school. This is Benito Juarez. This is uh, Sir Mac and Ashland and Blue Island. And I said, this is even worse. We got, we got to get rid of this one. And uh, I, I included this at the end of my slides. And uh, the guy who was working for Pilsen Alliance at the time said, don't say anything bad about sins. I said, why not? He said, the lawyer will stop giving us money. Now, at the time I was looking for work, but not that kind of work. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, I got hired at Civis. And uh, so I said, I don't, I'm not getting their money and I don't want their money. They're poisoning our community. This is hexavalent chromium that gets released, the, the Aaron Brockovich chemical. This is when they shred the metal, it heats up, the coating on the metal turns into hexavalent chromium. That's what our high school students get to breathe every day. That's what our, uh, that's what our teachers, at CTU teachers at, CPA, at Juarez get to breathe every day. Well, uh, they paid off Pilsen Alliance, so uh, now they deny it. Everybody that's at Pills Alliance wasn't there at this time, but they still deny it. Um, and you can go back and look at their website. Uh, this is what they said about Sims in 2014. They said, Sims, the current shredder, operates west of Ashland. Oh, hey. Uh, west of Ashland at 2500 South Wood. Sims is a, an international publicly traded corporation with a clean record by the EPA. Sims is also a unionized company offering living wages and benefits under operating under high safety standards. Well, I like unions, but you know, a union job isn't worth lung cancer. Um, you know, we had this issue when the union, uh, union workers worked at the coal plants in Pilsen. We still shut those down because uh, one guy working a union job for four years uh, is not as good as somebody who dies, or is not as, as good as somebody who stays alive. So uh, I did some, some math and uh, for every four years, there's 200 employees at the at the metal at the the coal plant, and uh, those coal plants were killing 200 people every four years. So for every person who worked at the coal plant uh, for four years, somebody died. And uh, I like again, I like union jobs, but not at the cost of people's lives. And that's the same. We didn't have a problem with shutting down the coal plants. Uh, we, we shouldn't have a problem shutting down this place, or at least making them clean up. Uh, and I don't know if we can clean these up. This is really hard to do. So they, they said they were operating under clean safety standards. Well, it turns out that about six months later, uh, they were under investigation by the EPA. Um, they were fined for a quarter of a million dollars, uh, and that got released uh, at right around Christmas, right before Christmas, and nobody covered it. I called up Michael Hawthorne at the Chicago Tribune, Harry Leiderson, uh, Block Club Chicago. Uh, this, is, this is a metal shredder poisoning our high school. They're just not interested in covering that story. It's so weird. Uh, so I wrote my own blog post about it. I wrote my experience about Pilsen Alliance. Uh, Pilsen's nonprofit industrial complex. You can see that on my website. Um, and so this is the nonprofit industrial complex. It's kind of a long uh, thing here, but uh, Jennifer Sima Samimi uh, wrote a significant number of people who believe in and work for social justice are employed in the nonprofit sector, an industry that requires organizations to compete for government and foundation finance, uh, funding. Uh, known as the nonprofit industrial complex, the system forces nonprofits to professionalize when they must focus on maintaining their funding sources rather than fulfilling their mission. So Pilsen Alliance's mission was to help out Pilsen, but that was compromised by having to get funding to pay their executives, to pay their assistants, and that came first. And that's why they became what was essentially a low-rent PR firm for a polluter in our neighborhood to keep out the competition. Uh, it was greenwash crony capitalism. Um, 
And so there's this great uh, series of talks, um, insight-national.org. Uh, I'll include the slides, and you guys can link to this one. Um, but the revolution will not be funded. Uh, we saw this with Michael Bloomberg's campaign. He spread out a whole bunch of money to the nonprofits, and all of a sudden everybody loves Michael Bloomberg, even though he was a Republican, right? So that's how the system works. Um, so we had these two metal shredders. Uh, one was being financed, one was financing Pills Alliance, another was financing this, uh, this church that I had less than uh, great experience with. Uh, suddenly this church that harbors uh, immigrants who are, who are threatening to be or they're being threatened to be deported, they house them. And suddenly they became interested in environmental policy and they became interested in jobs and said, we need these jobs. Well, the other group funded them. Uh, the other metal shredder funded them. Um, there's another fun little meme. Uh, you can call them poverty pimps. Oh, we got to save Pilsen. And really, they're just taking money from one side, pretend like they care about poor people. They don't care. Uh, there's another situation. This is a bike lane uprising. Uh, cyclist for 15 years. Finally just had to buy a car because we got a baby and, you know, need a car for a newborn in the city of Chicago is kind of tough. You don't need one, but it definitely makes things a lot easier. Um, but, you know, elephants in the bike lane, so she set up this thing on this database there where people can snap a picture and report it to the, uh, upload it to her database, and, um, and that gets, they, she reports it to the city. Uh, how am I doing today? Uh, got about 20 minutes, All right. more or less. Sure. Uh, I'll probably take it off. Okay. I'll try to keep it fast, though. Um, so she she created this database, and um, and it became wildly successful. Everybody told her it wasn't going to matter. She runs a great Twitter uh, feed as well, Bike Lane Uprising. Um, and so the Active Transportation Alliance. Anybody know Active Transportation Alliance? All right, some of you folks do. Um, they're they're big on uh, walking and cycling infrastructure. Um, they were interested. They're like, oh, we want to work with you. Give us your database. Give us your email list. Uh, and she's like, no. Th these people gave me their emails in confidence. I'm keeping my emails. They gave me. You know, they're uploading these pictures in confidence. I'm keeping my database. And they came in and tried to sh get her out of the way. And they've been, you know, bad talking her, bad mouthing her ever since. Uh, I met her campaigning last year. Two uh, last year. Um, Nice woman. Um, here's another case. So, um, has anybody seen this map? Chicago Cumulative Impact Map. Uh, this is a map of, uh, it puts together um, where the pollution is in the city and where the, uh, where the vulnerable populations are in the city. Minorities, young people, elderly. And adds them together and said, okay, this is where we really gotta go after um, is where we really have to address pollution. And you see, you know, the southwest side, I-55, from where, where I grew up, is not all, all that great. Um, and where I live now is not all that great. Uh, so NRDC published this with a uh, little village environmental justice organization, Southeast Environmental Task Force, Southeast Side Coalition, to ban pet coke, and other members of the environmental justice community. Um, and how are we going to address this, this injustice? Um, and I, I looked at that, and this was during my campaign, I'm like, man, that looks really, really familiar. And you know why it was really familiar? It's because I had made the same map uh, about eight months prior to that. Uh, you can find this on my GitHub. Uh, it's not linked here. Uh, I'll, I'll include that when I update these slides, hopefully. Um, so I made this map for the Illinois EPA, uh, the Environmental Justice Commission. I was working across the street from their meeting at the Thompson Center. So I'd go show up. And uh, they said, oh, there's this new bill, the Clean Energy Jobs Act, or Future Energy Jobs Act at the time. And, but we don't know who it applies to. This goes to environmental justice communities. We don't know who those are. I said, hey, uh, this should be like a quick, you know, a few hours of programming for me. I can make this map. And so I made the map, and here's a screenshot of it. And you see I covered all of Illinois because it was uh, Illinois. But I went with uh, a very even, I'm a statistician, a scientist. I don't like to make alarming sorts of things. You see, you know, the farms are all mostly clean air, and the cities are all mostly dirty air. 
And I, I, get, I put, made this tool, you can you know, click around a bunch, do a bunch of good stuff. And I handed this off to the Environmental Justice Commission. Um, they said, thank you so much. Um, and um, she's the, chair, she's the, the chair, chairman, chairwoman, Kim Wasserman. Uh, she's also the executive director of the Little, uh, Little Village Environmental Justice uh, <coughs> Organization. So she took the work that I did for the Illinois EPA. Then went to the NRDC and said, I have this great idea. We're going to do a cumulative impacts map. And so they, they spent eight months doing the work it took me uh, six to eight hours to do. Uh, and they redid it, except they just looked at Chicago and they changed the map from a color scheme of white to red to uh, blue to red. It really makes those colors pop. Although it makes a little bit exaggerated. And that's what they did. It took them eight months to do it. She invited every environmental justice organization in the city to help, except for Pero, except for our group, except for me. Um, and so I showed up to, I showed up to her, uh, showed up to this meeting where she was presenting this work, and the guy doing the presenting was like, well, the differences between this mat and this mat and this mat are X, Y, and Z. And I said, actually, there's no differences between the maps, because I made uh, all three of them. And uh, he was confused, and uh, there, there was one minor difference. So here's, I, you know, I changed the color scheme. I think I used the 2019, 2018 data instead of 2019. So this is, um, this is their map, and this is my map. You can see they're largely identical. Uh, there's a, a few uh, uh, technical details. So, yeah, that was, that was her, that, her whole thing was to finance. She couldn't include Pato, she couldn't include me because you can't get a nice big grant from, that, from the NRDC to do work that's already been done. It literally took me an hour to change this color scheme um, and, and focus just on Chicago. So it took them eight months to do and got all this grant money that went not to Pero, uh, but only to uh, El Vejo and NRDC. I don't think that's right, but that's how, that's how the nonprofit industrial complex works. She wasn't advancing the mission, she was advancing getting her salary um, and that's but it was funny so in that meeting her she said when I started explaining to the guy who seemed confused why I knew more about it than he was she said, oh, oh Troy was instrumental in this work well it would have been nice if you would have cited me in your big press release in the middle of my campaign hilariously one of my opponents ended up using this in all of his flyers um, the map that I was instrumental in making um, and so that's, that gets, brings us into the, the, the politics. There's this coal, coal plant closure. Um, again, this is an old talk, so I'll, I'll fast forward through this. But the coal plants were cl closed with a combination of activism, economics, and politics. And I think uh, the activists like to think it was all them. Uh, the politicians like to say it was all them. And uh, nobody likes to look at economics and say, oh, wow, uh, natural gas is a lot cheaper now. We don't need coal plants. Um, but it was a combination of all the two, or of all those three, and you see Pilsen Alliance is here, and I think Jack Ailey is right there for Pato, and um, let's get past this a little bit. Uh, oh, hilariously, uh, and so this gets into this nonprofit industrial complex. Um, full coal plant closure, um, Ron's first commercial turns a community victory into a personal victory. So I just said, you know, it was activism, politics, and, uh, and economics. Well, um, Kim Wasserman got a, a, became the face of Rahm's re-election campaign in 2015. So I really struggled with the decision to do that commercial after, of course, the campaign was underway and her face was on TV every day saying, thank you, Rahm, for closing down the coal plants. And everybody in the EJ community was pissed. We all showed up to a, a city, uh, city hall and had a, a press conference and blah, blah, blah. Um, whether or not that's tied to Ron Emanuel's friends giving her $150,000 the year before she did that commercial for him, I don't know. I think that's an open question, but I, some people have suggested that there's a quid pro quo here. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Lead in the Water, uh, this is a big campaign I did with Pedro. Uh, Miguel Del Toro, this guy came up to me 
uh, after my talk on the metal shredders back in 2015, he said, there's lead in the water. And I'm like, all right, this guy's crazy. Uh, he's going to start telling me about fluoride. He's like, I work for the US EPA. Uh, I am the lead and copper rule guy there. There's lead in our water. So I went and looked up his, his research. Um, turns out he's right. There is lead in Chicago's water. Uh, and he did the same uh, punch, uh, sorry to, to ruin the punchline here. Miguel Del Toro is the Flint whistleblower. Um, he, uh, he's the guy who CC'd his preliminary report on Flint to the ACLU when the Democrats and the Republicans were giving him the runaround. And he's the reason he saved lives. Um, he happens to be my neighbor and my friend. And he came up to me bef uh, a couple years before he blew the whistle there, or a year before he blew the whistle there, and he said, there's lead in the water. And he did the same thing in Chicago in 2011 that he did uh, in Flint. Um, he CC'd the Chicago Tribune on his preliminary report and showed that uh, the lead service lines in the city of Chicago are uh, leaching lead. And the water main replacements and the water meter installations were uh, exacerbating that issue. And this is your lead service. This is a service line. 70% of the homes in Chicago have them. If you have uh, pregnant women or, or uh, small children in the house, um, just get a lead water filter. The whole point of Miguel's research uh, that he did in 2011 was that it's really hard to test for lead. And it's just a big distraction. Um, you, know, you can see his, his results here. So his slide, you can see uh, in the disturbed lead service line where water mains uh, and water meters were, were uh, installed or, or water meters were installed and water mains were replaced. Uh, you see this is the EPA action level. These are the elevated lines. Um, and here is the undisturbed lines. And no problems. So it seems pretty cut and dry. So I handed out 300 lead water uh, filters in Pilsen, I believe, in, uh, in direct action. You know, it's nice to do a rally and all, but while you're doing a rally, how about you just hand out some lead water filters? So we got a couple of small grants for that. Uh, there's my friend Dan Wall in the background. Um, uh, he, he helped tremendously. Um, and yeah, so here's uh, our revolution. I'm a big Bernie fan. I supported his campaign. And, 2015 offered to help do his data science. Um, so I, I supported his campaign before he announced his first presidential campaign in 2015. Um, so I like Bernie Sanders, but our revolution really frustrated me because they, their big, uh, one of their big cam issues was lead contamination, uh, lead in the water. And they made this issue, and, um, and then Ron decided that he's, he's not going to run. And as soon as he stopped running, uh, as soon as he said he wasn't going to run again, fell off the radar of our revolution. They laid off their lead organizer before the, camp, the election was even over. So like, they didn't care about the issue, they just cared about beating Rahm over the head with it. Meanwhile, the city's still being led. Um, happily ever after, Rahm finally changed his policy and is exiting. Uh, Lightfoot even better, uh, paused the water meter installations. Um, and, and as I was just saying, screaming this for years, and uh, finally these people went on WBZ and said, do, you, do Chicago residents need to have their water tested? As a doctor, she says, I think the immediate answer probably is no. And uh, that seemed confusing to people, and I, if you're interested, I suggest you go listen to that, but basically the answer is, testing for lead is so hard in your water, it's not worth taking the risk. Uh, you're probably going to get a false negative, meaning, well, there's a good chance that if you have lead in the water, there's a 90% chance the test won't pick it up. So don't even mess around if you get kids or pregnant women in the house. I got our uh, lead service line replaced. It was expensive, but it was very necessary. Um, so moving on to, to stereogenics, the media. Um, so this is just before the gubernatorial election. Uh, emissions from Willowbrook Company could be harmful to residents, federal report says. Uh, this came out uh, two months before the election, and Governor Rauner had an ownership stake in the company. Um, became the whole thing. This is probably why the Democrats won. So this is where I grew up. I grew up a mile from this. Uh, we moved a bunch of times, but uh, all the places we moved so we could stay in the same school district. Um, uh, or always within a mile of this place. My sister, my nephew, uh, who, who, who won this uh, sectional today, uh, lives less than a mile from this place. Um, so I'm, I'm glad they, they shut it down or they're cleaning it up. Oh yeah, so this is where 
I, I live in all this area. I went to Gower Middle, and that's where my nephew goes now. I went to Gower West, I went to Hinsdale South. Um, so I grew up with all that. It, it hits close to home. Um, Sterogenics is leaving, resolved in one year. Isn't that great? Well, a lot of my friends and neighbors are wealthy people. Uh, we, my family is not. We just went to the unincorporated areas because that's my mom was big in education. Hinsdale South is a good school, but very multicultural. I really appreciated it. Um, meanwhile, up in Lake County, in a Latino neighborhood, still going. Two years later, nobody gives a shit. That's messed up. Uh, H. Kramer, uh, campaign, uh, Perro's first campaign. 14 years to get that result. 14 years. They were blasting lead into the neighborhood. All, uh, all just northwest of, uh, of Cermak and Loomis. Blasting lead for 100 years. Uh, the backyards were so polluted, uh, they had to dig them up and replace everybody's backyard. Perro did that in conjunction with the US EPA. But that took 14 years. Sterogenics, that's Latinos. Nobody gives a shit about Mexicans. Uh, Sterogenics, rich white people, we gotta get on that. I mean, no offense, you know, I'm, I hope to be a rich white person someday too. Um, but, uh, you know, not the case. So, so circling back to the metal shredders, there's a metal shredder in Lincoln Park. Uh, neighbors say Lincoln Park scrapyard creates toxic mess. Well, they were concerned about general iron polluting. And, you know, it was just so serious. There's a pause facility across the street, for God's sakes. What are we going to do about these dogs breathing in this polluted air? So this gets all sorts of coverage. Um, test done. Story after story. General iron, oh, this, sorry, this picture did not uh, load. General iron is out. They got kicked out of Lincoln Park. They'll be gone in two years. Rom extended their uh, permit for a couple of years, but they're gone. They're going to be replaced by Lincoln Yards. Well, uh, <coughs> where are they going to move to? The southeast side, another Latino neighborhood. Surprise. Um, yep. And so, that's, that's sad. Uh, now, I'll contrast this again with Sims. Sims, we weren't concerned about them polluting. We weren't, they weren't maybe going to get fined. They were polluting. They were fined a quarter of a million dollars. Again, Tribune, Block Club Chicago, nobody covered it. Why not? That's so weird. Maybe it's because they paid off Pilsen Alliance. The guy, uh, the guy who is now our alderman, uh, Byron Sikcho Lopez, uh, was their champion. And so nobody cares about, about Sims and Pilsen. Um, so here's that uh, sorry, it's $225,000 fine that was assessed. Um, the, again, you, the only place that you could read about it was an industry trade journal. Um, and so this is how all this works out. And so I uh, spent a little bit too much time making this graphic. Uh, and so basically, here's industry. I work for IBM. I'm not anti-industry. I, 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 uh, I'm not a socialist or a capitalist. I have a degree in game theory. Uh, I think different markets have different incentives. Uh, and so some markets respond to competition better, some markets respond to cooperation, like Medicare for all, healthcare industry should be socialized. Uh, that's another discussion, but you got industry here, they get the money from uh, you buying in their stuff. Uh, they give that money to politicians. So uh, Ida Sepulveda, uh, the Democrat who stole my, my IoT, my data science platform overnight apparently, um, she took a few thousand dollars from an engineering firm. An engineering firm does work with MWRD. So that's, that's that relationship right there. Uh, that, those companies just, uh, imagine this is Pilsen Alliance and this is Sims. They give money uh, usually under the table or through a lawyer. We, we know how, you've seen how Trump uses his lawyer to, to obfuscate where this money comes from. So they give them, this is this supposed to represent nonprofits. And the nonprofits, you know, work together with the politicians to show they're working with the community. Uh, they, the nonprofits and the, the politicians, give uh, the journalists some narrative. And then the journalists give that narrative to you to consume. And uh, the cycle goes around and around. Uh, and this is, this is where we get into Troy blindness. So uh, I've called out bad journalists. I really love good journalists like Glenn Greenwald, Matt Taibbi. Uh, Big fan of those guys. They, they do good work. 
Uh, I'm not a big fan of, of hacks, political hacks who are just advancing some, some narrative. So MSNBC, Fox News, uh, you just know that they're like, oh, this, they work for the Democratic establishment or the Republican establishment. They're hacks. They don't actually ask tough questions. They, they're here cooperating with all these groups to give you a narrative. Um, and uh, so I, I've suffered from uh, something called uh, what they call now Bernie blindness. Um, you know, you see this all the time in the, narr in the media. Bernie's pulling first. Well, they'll tell you. Uh, Buttigieg is surging. Biden came in second place. Like, well, who came in first place? Oh, we don't want to mention Bernie. So uh, this is a really entertaining uh, site called Bernie Blindness uh, Reddit subreddit. Uh, you should check it out. Just Google Bernie Blindness. Uh, very entertaining stuff. Uh, so I was endorsed by the Tribune, surprisingly, um, given that I'm not uh, usually aligned with them. And I wrote uh, in my, my uh, campaign 2019 in their questionnaire, uh, they, they asked, what's the most pressing issue facing the people of your ward, and how would you address it? They said the most pressing issue facing our, facing our ward was corruption. Now, I don't know if you guys know about the 25th Ward, but um, our alderman was Danny Solis. And uh, shortly after I uh, wrote after I submitted my, my questionnaire to the Chicago Tribune, it came out that uh, Danny Solis, this was in January, this one's for March, but came out in January that Danny Solis was a mole because he was corrupt. My whole campaign was anti-corruption, but I could not get any journalist to, to cover my, I spent a half hour on the phone with the Sun-Times reporter. So what's your campaign? Everybody's confused. Well, why would you make a campaign about corruption? And then, uh, this comes out, and I figured, oh, I hit the jackpot, I got the right message at the right time. Totally ignored. Um, because I don't make a lot of friends, when you tell the truth, that, t that tends to happen. Um, so, you know, even though uh, Sepulveda's already stolen my, our cam uh, my campaign, Cam, uh, cam Davis has already stolen the Green Party campaign from two years ago, already we have these ideas out there. Um, I expect we will continue to be ignored. Uh, I ask for your help and your support. Uh, we don't take uh, corporate uh, campaign contributions. Um, we don't engage in that legal, uh, legalized corruption. So I hope to get uh, your support for, for our campaign. And um, I'm happy to take some of your questions. Thank you. You can hear, huh? Uh, a fun night last night. You know, I gotta, gotta uh, enjoy myself this evening. Here is the dog. Here is the dog. That's right. Uh, so I'm not familiar with the format. This is this is the Q and A section, right? All right. Could, could you explain how wastewater is uh, transformed into drinking water? I mean, it's a big thing, but can you explain it briefly? Uh, it's done on the space, uh, on, on the, oh, oh yeah, I'll repeat the question, thank you. Uh, how, how is uh, waste, the question is how is wastewater uh, transformed into drinking water? And uh, that's not actually what we do in the, in, in the MWRD. We actually clean it up just enough to send downstream down the Mississippi to the, the places down, downstream. Um, we don't do it so well. Actually, if you go to um, if you go to my map, you'll see that as uh, state of Illinois. It will take maybe some time to come up. Let's see. Uh, you'll see as you go down the Mississippi in the state of Illinois, uh, the cancer uh, incidence goes up and up, which is really surprising given uh, they're living in in essentially a farm town. Um, let's see if I can pull this up real fast. Ah, I don't have the link. All right, well, yeah, so if you, if you were to go to this link and see cancer rates, you'd see they spike. They, they gradually increase until there's a relatively high cancer rate on the southern part of, of uh, Illinois. And, uh, just one second, and so 
We clean it up, but we don't clean it up so well that we can drink it. So we're, we're not NASA. I'm not. Uh, although I have done some work for NASA, uh, we're not doing that. We're just cleaning it up just enough to send it down down the, the canal in the city. Um, so I don't uh, have. I don't know all of that uh, good stuff. Um. Yeah, yeah. Here in Chicago, an alderman's first duty is to walk through the uh, really day-to-day -day, uh, problems of his constituents or her constituents. Uh, you happen to be in a very, very changing ward. Housing, as I understand it, is getting to be a lot more expensive than it was even five years ago. All right, let's uh, cut down on a background noise, please, so we can get a questioner. are no longer able to uh, live. Uh, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Um, so, so, so as alderman, as alderman, what would you be doing to uh, get down to the nitty gritty and take care of the day to day needs of the constituents that you're going to be serving? Um, let's see. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. So yeah, I'm not running for alderman. I'm running for Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. Um, that said, uh, and the question is, uh, what? Uh, it was about gentrification in Pilsen and rising rents and what I would be doing had I won uh, this election. Um, you, can, you can see some of my point of views here, um, but again, pissing off journalists that don't do a good job. So they get fed this story that gentrification in Pilsen, is, uh, white people are taking our houses. And, um, and there's a big missing component to that issue. It's something I really care about because, again, this is the community where my family is from going back 100 years. Uh, I mostly grew up in the suburbs, but I've been there now for about 20 years. Um, and what nobody talks about is Obama's immigration policy. Uh, some of us called him the deporter in chief. Uh, deported more people than, than any president before him. Um, and so Pilsen is an immigrant community. But every, every article you read about, in Pilsen, about gentrification in Pilsen doesn't mention any immigrants. It's the weirdest thing. How are you going to write about an immigrant community but not write about immigrants? Uh, so actually, if you look at immigration statistics, uh, Rob Peral is a really great uh, demographer here in the city of Chicago. We had a great podcast talking about um, our neighborhoods are like uh, Chicago is like a great river that uh, starts in Pilsen and flows down in the BNSF, the, flows down I-55. Again, this is what my family has done. Flew and uh, flowed down to Burbank and down into, uh, grew up in Willowbrook. Um, they don't talk about that. So immigra Mexican immigration in Chicago and the United States is negative for the last 10 years. Uh, the, the previous, from, from the 90s, immigration explosion, uh, due in large part to NAFTA, of course, when they destroyed the Campesinos uh, industry there. The, the Mexican farmers had to come up here for work. Um, so the, the housing stock in Pilsen is really old and dilapidated. I got a, eight, a building from 1890 that I've been fixing up for the last three and a half years. Um, it required a lot of work. The, the second unit was uninhabitable. I should have gotten Pritzker's tax attorney. I could have probably got a tax break, uh, but I'm not, uh, I'm not that wealthy. So, um, so it, you know, the, the, the buildings need a lot of work. Well, when those immigrants are gonna come in and rent these trash apartments that, that really people should not be living in, they gotta get fixed up, fire hazards. Um, when those people aren't gonna rent them, who are you gonna rent them to? You, you, you are left with a choice. Either you fix up or you sell. Because you can't rent it to the 22-year-old you know, uh, guy from, from Oaxaca that's happy to, to pay 400, bents, uh, 400, 400 bucks a month for rent and uh, send the money home. He's happy to live in that apartment. A UIC student would rather pay seven, 600. So there is an issue there with, with uh, rising rents but I think the component that people aren't recognizing is that market dynamic. But getting, getting back to my original question, uh, 
you're going to be serving a, con a constituency over a million people. Always there, and it's always been there. And these are the people that are going to vote for you and that are going to serve in your organization. Jesus uh, These are you're going to be your first concern. What are you inclined to do to the people that already live there that have some real problems? I am not the alderman, um, and this is a little bit out of the scope of the MWRD. The thing I can do is lower our property taxes by getting rid of the crony capitalism, uh, the, the, the corruption of, hey, I'll give you this sweetheart uh, contract if you donate to my campaign. I've been running on this issue for five years. Uh, so the, the question is, what am I going to do to help Filson out? And uh, the MWRD handles most of Cook County, so all of Cook County is my constituents. I don't have much, uh, I wouldn't have much power as an MWRD commissioner uh, other than lowering taxes for people uh, via, you know, more honest use of our tax dollars. That's, that's the best I could do as an MWRD commissioner. Yeah. Are you familiar with the ramifications and uh, things that Deep Tunnel has. Are you familiar with the Jardin water plant and how it works? And about the largest uh, sewer treatment plant in the world at Stickney, Illinois, and how it works? So the uh, Stickney water plant, so my parents divorced when I was young, so my dad lived in Burbank. And, uh, I grew up in Willowbrook, uh, spent the weekends in Burbank, and we, uh, we would drive past the Stickney water plant uh, every weekend a few times and go out the windows. and. Um, but my turn, question turn is, do you know how it fundamentally cleans the water? Do you know how the Jardin plant works when it pulls its water out of Lake Michigan in the filtration process? And do you know about how water is distributed in meters? So, I mean, are you familiar with the water infrastructure of the Chicago area, seeing as how you're going to run on the MWRD commission? Sure. Uh, so the question is, uh, am I familiar with the water infrastructure in the city of Chicago, given that I'm running for MWRD? Um, so just to, to clarify, there, there's two kind of components to the water infrastructure. I worked on uh, lead in the water, so I, 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 I've sort of made, you know, uh, autodidacted myself into becoming an expert uh, on uh, the, the water coming in from Lake Michigan, getting treated, uh, and then ending up uh, going through our lead service lines and ending up at our taps. That is not what the MWRD does. The MWRD does not handle that part of the water uh, infrastructure. Um, the MWRD handles the water going down the drain, going down the sewers. And yeah, they, they go into our combined sewer system, uh, which, so, so to be fair, I'm still, uh, the Green Party asked me to run. Uh, given my previous work with, with water and my previous interest, and that my uh, campaign has aligned quite well. Uh, Anti-corruption, getting corporate contributions out of the MWRD is the same thing I've been running on for five years. Have you visited the MW, the Stickney plant then? I have, the question is, have I uh, visited the Stickney water plant? No, I have not. I need to do that. Um, again, the... Uh, the um, my baby on the way in, in six and a half weeks requires that I finish putting up my drywall. Uh, so I, I hope to get to that over the summer because uh, the drywall is getting up this week. Um, but no, I'm familiar with it. This is why I know we needed an IoT solution because I talked with uh, some folks uh, in my work with Pero about flooding. And so the problem is, you know, the, the deep tunnel project is great and it's helped. But part of the problem is the feeder lines into the deep tunnels are uh, too small. And so if we want to know which of the sewers that we got to replace and expand to alleviate the flooding in people's homes, this is where your IoT, sorry, IoT is uh, Internet of Things. Those little sensors that I, I, I propose we use and then Ida Sepulveda proposed that we use. Um, uh, stealing my idea, uh, yes. Um, that those will help tremendously with it. So that's that's my area of expertise. Um, I do need to continue to, to gather more expertise on the on the, the okay. sewers. So we had we had a question over there. Um, the, the, uh, she, she was actually there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the cancer map that you showed. Um, Five percent of the pollution 
in the Mississippi River comes from the city. Mm -hmm. 95% comes from farms up right and down the Mississippi River. So do you think that cancer uh, cluster that you saw down on, I was down by St. Louis, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, do you think that cancer cluster is caused by the pollution that comes from farms, uh, from Illinois farms? Or would you attribute it to the um, radiation uh, uh, that's now become prominent around St. Louis? Uh, the, so the question is, uh, would I attribute the, the, the apparent cancer uh, sort of hot spot in the southern Illinois to uh, our, the MWRDs shipping the, the water down the canal? No, no. Oh, the uh, fact five percent, you say? It's only five percent coming yeah. from the city, and the, the rest of that enormous amount of pollution comes off the farms that are uh, adjacent to the Mississippi, and so that cancer cluster doesn't have very much to do, I, I mean, what do you think, I, it doesn't have much to do with the pollution coming out of Chicago. So the, 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 the question is, uh, do I think the cancer cluster has to do with the runoff from farms? Yeah. Um, and uh, our, our questioner uh, suggested that 5% of the pollution in, in the Mississippi comes from the city, the other 95% comes from the farms. Um, I'm not familiar with those statistics. But the reason I made this, this tool, uh, the reason I made this tool, and again, sorry, this one's not interactive, um, was because the human eye is really good at picking out patterns. Sometimes we're so good we pick out patterns that are, are not actually there. Um, and that's why I made this a visualization, instead of just giving them uh, a list of, of, um, of census tracts. I could have given them, you know, that would have taken me 20 minutes to put together a list of census tracts, that, that qualify for the Future Energy Jobs Act, um, but so I, I don't know. I you know that's a that's a question I pose to other experts in the field, which I, I am not an expert on cancer. I'm, I, I'm a statistician. I'm an expert at, at, at uh, wrangling data in Excel spreadsheets. Uh, and so when I visualized it like that, it was it was really striking to me, and it's something that I will continue to ask around. But I I don't know. I I don't have that information. Just a couple of short questions. Yeah. Louder, please. A couple of short questions. Let's do one at a time. To, to decide what I'm going to say in oh, okay. minutes. First, have you ever heard of Henry George and land value taxation? The question is, have I heard of Henry George and land value taxation? The answer is no, I have not. Are you familiar with the Cascadia Independence Project on the West Coast to try to make a watershed, the, the Cascadia River watershed into its own independent country? Uh, the question <laughs> is, am I familiar with Cascadia water? Uh, Cascadia Indep Cascadia Independence uh, project to turn Cascadia watershed into its own state country. Uh, I think I've heard something about that. There's all sorts of like interesting. We should split California up into four states, and I'll, I've heard these things, but I'm not super familiar with that one in particular. I'll tell you about it in a few minutes. And last thing. How much of the position you're running for has to do with issues like drainage, elevation, surveying, and, uh, and do you have any problems with the borders of the district? Uh, the question so is, uh, how much of, of the NWRD, NWRD work has to, to do with uh, drainage and elevation? Drainage, elevation, and surveying, surveying, and also is there a problem? With, do the borders need to be reformed? And do the borders need to be reformed? Um, it has a lot to do with, with surveying. The surveying gives you the elevations. The elevations contribute to flooding. Uh, uh, so let me back let me back up a little bit. Uh, again, my, my expertise is in statistics and data. Um, and I don't, when people try to get me to talk about something that I'm not an expert on, uh, or when other people try to talk about data science, uh, I know when they're BSing me because I know what I'm talking about. Uh, and so as an expert in this one field, I really try to rely on other folks who are experts in that area. So I'm not going to pretend to be an expert engineer, uh, uh, an expert surveyor. Um, I know the data, and that's why I want to get some more data in there. Um, the, the issue of flooding is obviously uh, has a lot to do with uh, elevations and where the water drains to. Um, so yeah, it is, it is heavily involved. 
uh, the, the borders of the area. So it's, it's really interesting as I have started you know, ramping up my campaign. We don't have a primary on March 17th. Um, you'll only see my name on the ballot in November. Uh, as I've sort of gathered my expertise there and looked into the, the, the boundaries of the NWRD, uh, the interesting part is, so I have a friend who owns a brewery uh, down in the south, south suburbs, um, Rabbit Brewing. And he's in Cook County, but he's not in the MWRD district. Um, so I think that's, that's uh, historically interesting how that's all played out. Whether or not we should change the borders, I don't know. I don't need to think more about that. Is that in Homewood? Thank you. Yeah, Homewood. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All uh, right, Jonathan, I think, was next. Jonathan? Thank you, Troy. How can people spend their dollars strategically as everyday consumers and supporters of campaigns which end this environmental apartheid and put pressure on powerful corporations, legislatures, and the lack of fairness in how working class communities are served? So voting with our dollars comes. The question is how can we vote with our dollars uh, and, uh, to, to end the environmental apartheid? Um, you know, I think Bernie Sanders has the right idea. Uh, small dollar contributions to uh, go go for politicians that don't take uh, corporate campaign uh, contributions uh, because that those are the incentives. I really believe in incentives. Uh, as somebody who studied economics via game theory, people respond to incentives. And you know when an engineering firm gives a water commissioner two thousand dollars. Uh, it seems like chump change. Why would they do something for two thousand dollars? But politicians are cheap. They are a cheap date, and it's pretty easy. You know, you give them. Uh, my my favorite was uh, Danny Solis in in my ward when I was running against him five years ago. He would take like two hundred and fifty bucks from somebody, change, and it's just like two hundred and fifty bucks, and he would change the zoning uh, for somebody. It was like clockwork. They'd get uh, this the uh, the developer would give him 200, 250 bucks. The next week, he'd put it up on the, the zoning commission. It passed through the zoning commission, another 250 bucks. Passed through the city council, another 250 bucks. Uh, finally, get approved by the Department of Planning, another 250 bucks. You're like, man, you just changed the zoning from uh, a two flat to a 17-story building for I don't know, all a, a total a, a thousand or a few thousand dollars. And you know that changes zoning, more housing. That's good. But uh, what what was interesting is that the neighbors then went from living next to a two flat to living next to a, essentially a skyscraper. And they're living in in the shadows all day now. Um, and so that's that's just a little bit of money. Politicians are cheap. So you know if we if we stay focused on small dollar donations to uh, stay supportive of politicians with small dollar contributions. Um, I think that's how we can help end this. And I think that uh, that's why I've, I've been self-financing and only taking small dollar contributions from anybody who visits my website. Um, and I, I hope you uh, will, will support the Green Party in, in that um, in that effort. That's, that's the only way I can see out of this. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, this gentleman in the back. All right. Yes. Um, the thing about what's happening in Pilsen and the uh, Mexicans being forced out, before that, it was Czechs that lived there. Neighborhoods change over time. That's just the natural flow of things over the country. Yes, yeah, so what's, you know, if you again go to this uh, gentrification in Pilsen post that I have, uh, parts one and two. Um, you know, the Pilsen population uh, declined by 25% between 1930 and 1950, uh, or 1960, and that was largely due to the uh, reduced immigration from Czechoslovakia, or the Czech Republic, uh, because their civil war had ended after World War I. Um, and so Pilsen depopulated. And so my family actually lived at Harrison and Racine. Uh, so we were actually gentrified out by UIC, which I took all my graduation photos 
with my grandfather and my dad staring at the parking lot that was their home. Um, and so, and it's that time that all the Mexicans went into Pilsen. Uh, my, fa uh, my grandfather was uh, a World War II vet, so he's lucky enough to qualify for the uh, VA benefits and uh, buy this home in Burbank that he built. Um, Keep the change shirt. That's the whole point. These are natural cycles. So that, yeah, so, and this is why, again, you see history repeating itself with reduced immigration from Mexico, actually negative immigration, so migration back to Mexico. Um, and so I, I think, you know, it's hugely underreported, and it draws me up a wall every time somebody reports on gentrification in Pilsen and doesn't mention the historic, this is truly historic, uh, turnaround in the Mexican national population, and not just Pilsen, not just Chicago, okay. but nationwide. Um, I, don't think there's, I don't think there's a problem. Uh, well, I mean, there's, there's lots of problems, All right. uh, but it's a complicated story. We're going to have to go to rebuttal soon, so we got one more question. Uh, Can I get that one? Uh, let him get the last question. When, when will, Let's go when to will, When will sea walls be made on, um, um, built on the, on the lake shore shoreline? Uh, the question is when will sea walls be built on uh, the Lake Michigan shoreline? Um, the uh, climate change, so I went to uh, the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change. I spent a uh, summer at Berkeley in grad school uh, studying the mathematics of climate change with them. Uh, and, you know, again, I grew up in Willowbrook, and at the time I was in my 20s, so all my, all my uh, hippie deadhead friends uh, were slowly becoming Republicans at that point, and they never left the suburbs. And, um, and so, in, in trying to explain the urgency of climate change to them, and my band was touring uh, northern Michigan, Traverse City, Kalamazoo, uh, quite a bit at the time. And so the way I tried to explain it to them was, um, uh, get a gun and move to northern Michigan because the uh, Chicago's climate is going to be much more like the Mediterranean climate uh, by the time my kids are grown and by the time, uh, you know, should they decide to have children of their own, by the time I, I'm a grandparent. Um, and, and that was my way to get across to them, which is the urgency. Uh, luckily, and the reason, part of the reason why I've stayed in the Chicagoland area um, is because we are actually one of the places that are best equipped to deal with uh, climate change. Um, the weather's going to get a little bit warmer, but the lake levels are at historic highs right now, but there's a lot of variation there. And I don't expect, I expect those lake levels to go down. The problems that we're going to have and that the MWRD is going to have to address is Sure, Chicago's going to get a little bit warmer, and how that's going to shake out with lake levels, I, I think the best research I've seen is that the lake levels will not dramatically depart because it's going to get warmer, more evaporation, uh, all these different things. But what we're going to have, though, is uh, more of these dramatic weather events, huge downpours that we're going to have to deal with. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, sudden downpours that we're going to have to deal with, and and our, our sewer systems aren't yeah. equipped to handle that. And I, okay. I don't think anybody expects our sewer systems to be able to handle that. And that's why we need to get some more green infrastructure, which is difficult to maintain, but it's a lot easier to maintain some green infrastructure than it is to uh, throw everything in your basement out when it gets flooded. Um, so. To answer your question, I don't think we're going to need seawalls. We might need to spend more time putting the sand back in uh, on the beaches once the, the water levels recede. Um, but I don't, I, I, at this point, I don't think we're going to need to build uh, bigger seawalls. That's just, that's just my, it's, it's literally just uh, a guess, guesstimate. Those waves are hitting on the south side and the, and the north side. They're really crashing into the... Into the, into the buildings up to Lakeshore Drive. Oh, no, I, I, again, as a cyclist going on the Lakeshore path, so the, the issue, is, or the question, I guess, comment, is that those waves are hitting the Lakeshore. Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. Well, I, yeah, when, when those waves are high, I, I have to check, and I'm biking up to the north side to go see a Cubs game. Um, I really have to uh, go and check the wind. If the wind's blowing in, uh, I'm taking Halstead. Okay. If the wind's blowing out, I will uh, take the Lake Shore path. Um, but again, we're at historic highs, and don't expect those historic highs to maintain. You know, in another 10 years, we could be at historic lows. And you can be asking right. 
should we start pumping water and reverse the flow of the Chicago River? So that's an open question. I guess we'll have to see. Uh, Charlie gets the last question. I've got a quick question. Yeah, Troy, uh, if the Greens get in charge, it sounds like no one is going to have a job. You shut down everything in your neighborhoods and factories and that have been there for years. Yeah. So that's a, so that so that's more of a statement, but uh, the the the, oh, the I mean, comment. Uh, no, I'll, I'll respond to it accordingly. Don't worry. You're happy, you guys are looking for one thing after another. Yeah. Yeah. So so the uh, the, the comment is is that if the Greens get in power, uh, nobody's going to have any jobs because we're shutting everything down. And um, you know that's not actually how Elise Pero. Uh, Pilsen Environmental Rights Reform Organization that I've come up in these last few years. It's not really our thinking on the subject, so right now... Well, how many companies have they opened? Have they opened? Uh, we have not opened any companies. We're a non-profit. Um, but, no, so there's there's uh, an issue we're dealing with right now is uh, Lakeside Lithography. It's at uh, Laughlin and 16th Street. Um, they are a, a lithography that they, they coat metal. And man, there is a stink coming out of there. It's like a chemical smell, and it's right across the street from Pilsen Academy, um, and it just stinks. And and we've actually gotten a, a surge in membership to Pedro, uh on this specific issue that it stinks so much. And so what we've been doing is we we work with they they've been fined by the the US EPA, uh, investigated by the Illinois yeah. EPA, okay. and we're actually working with um, right. a UIC professor of chemistry. Uh, to uh, he's a Don, Don Wink is a is a good good man. Um, he's working with us, uh, looking at these EPA reports, and he's actually he's actually having to uh, give some training to the EPA uh, scientists and engineers that are that are doing this research. And what we found actually is that we don't need them to shut down to clean up. What is making this smell that is a nuisance is very likely them mishandling their own product and wasting it, just leaving the, the tub uncovered. And so we don't want those jobs to go away. We actually want to save them money and make them more profitable. At least that's our latest theory uh, with our latest uh, emails with the, uh, with the EPA. So uh, we're, we're very strongly in favor of, of jobs. And, and I again, I work for IBM. I'm not against industry. I'm not against jobs. Um, but there's cleaner ways to do it. We don't have to, it's not an either or. Uh, it's, okay. it's, it's a yes and. We All can right. have jobs and a clean environment. Okay. Follow up. Give yeah, our speaker up. a hand. All right. All right. Let's go to rebuttals, Andy. This is rebuttal time. Let me have a show of hands to see who wants to give a rebuttal or say something about, uh, add something that he did. Uh, one, two, over here. Shut everything down. Three, four, four, five. Keep your hands up. No, it's actually eight. Okay, we'll go to the usual three minutes. So it's like about ten feet. All right. Like we should power off and not drop the Hit it twice. Oh, well, I wanted to say something about Flint, Michigan. The, the cost-cutting decision to transition Flint, Michigan's water supply to to the Flint River in April 2014 likely resulted in lead leaching into the drinking water in Flint, Michigan. That affected a lot of the kids. There was a big scandal about that. A lot of us believe that when turning on our tap that that the water is safe and clean. Another affordability justice issue is the need to invest in infrastructure and finally to get rid of the lead service lines. The current pace of pipe replacement is about two centuries. Those pipes will stay in the earth for two centuries when, when they should be replaced. And, 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 and to, to switch to the old for the new, but the useful life of pipes is one century. Lead in pediatrics is well known as a silent epidemic. Kids don't present acutely with lead issues it, it's sometimes it, it's sometime something we don't see for years, if not decades later, when they have problems with cognition and behavior. The poor cannot afford to have pipes replaced, so it's going to be the privileged and the affluent who have 
the ability to get safe drinking water. Another problem is, is, the, top, is the top selling brands of bottled water and 93% of individual bottles show evidence of microplastic contamination. The water study found twice as many plastic particles of similar size in bottled water as in tap water. This plastic is in your tap water too. The, the, the data shows that the majority of these bottled water plastics come from the bottling process. Thank you. I want to thank our speaker. Uh, my name is Joe. I'm running for Congress up in Lake County, the 10th district. I'm friends with the leader of the Green Party up there, Ethan, who's been here before. Um, I, I appreciate the speaker said that he's not a socialist and not a capitalist. There's a lot of room in between, and I think uh, I'm a libertarian, but I'm a left-leaning libertarian, so I think for our studies of Georgism, the ideas of Henry George, and mutualism, which is really the foundation for anarchism, uh, if we study those things, we can use them to make the free markets freer and fairer at the same time. And I'm glad to hear that our speaker isn't totally opposed to markets, because I think you know, markets and self-regulation still have their place. And more libertarians are realizing that pollution is a violation of people's property rights, whether that means their land or their air or their actual body, if they're trying to describe your body as your property. So it's good that there's kind of this bridge being built between the left and the right on environmental justice issues. Because we can fight forever about labor and workers on the left and capitalists and capital, financial capital, physical capital on the right. They can fight all day, and they have been for 200 years. But if we study Georgism and mutualism, we can focus taxation and borders and all kinds of different issues on land. There's land, labor, and capital. Focus on land so we can stop fighting over labor and capital and end the left versus right division. Because both left and right agree we need to save our planet and that's the most important thing. The reason I mentioned Cascadia and the drainage and elevation issues is because if we just use the borders that nature gave us, mountain ranges, instead of having dead men in the sand that are straight, then we could we could figure out where all the water pollution is coming from. We'd be able to trace it upstream more easily and sue whoever's responsible for it without getting any central or federal government involved. See, I think land is an inherently local issue because land like pollution affects the land, air, and water of where you're at. Like, what are the odds that someone in D.C. cares about Lake County or Cook County's pollution issues? Um, why should we give 49 states the right to bury their nuclear waste in one state, for example? So land is a local issue. We need to diminish the power of the central government. I'm actually against the EPA because I think we could do it better locally because I'm not too... Uh, the current administration is using the EPA for evil. Some of these departments are going to be used for evil, and they're like the ring in Lord of the Rings. We need to destroy them before someone used them for evil and reclaim our power to legislate on environmental issues locally where we're sure people care about them. Thanks. And could you please announce that people will do their private conversations outside and stop this low level of talking? There's a low level of crosstalk among a bunch of people here tonight. If, if you'd uh, please take it outside if you're going to talk uh, while the speaker is trying to do the rebuttal, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, just what the last speaker said about uh, these these agencies being used for evil. Last time I was here, I told you about FERC, F-E-R-C, which is uh, setting up rules that will destroy Illinois' goals for climate control and uh, especially the building of uh, structures to create electric power. Uh, and I just wanted to reaffirm what he just said. But what I, uh, what I came up here to talk about is that for the last two days, I've been at hearings at the Illinois Commerce Commission. And uh, that was really, really boring, except very rarely there something came up that was pretty interesting. Um, uh, I won't go into anything except one of the witnesses who was hired by um, Energy Transfer Partners. Now, Energy Transfer Partners owns the 
uh, Dakota Access Pipeline. The Illinois Commerce Commission had hearings on the uh, uh, getting DAPL through Illinois, and they were almost secret, and so DAPL did come through Illinois. So the hearings that I've been at were to double the pressure in the pipeline. And uh, I, I will say that people say there's just no chance not to double it. The oil coming out of Bakken is very corrosive and that pipeline will get, the pipes will get thinner and thinner because the oil is very corrosive. But uh, the thing I wanted to bring to you tonight, there was a witness there from um, uh, Energy Transfer Partners, and the first question to him was, how much are you being paid? And he said, $750 per hour. And he had been there for two days because, you know, he didn't get called until yesterday. And so the second question was, how much have you been paid so far? for being here, and the answer was $100,000 for the time that it took him to come from Massachusetts and stay in Chicago for two days. Uh, and I really think that was, that was the thing that just made me hoot about these hearings. There, uh, there was a lot that I learned at the hearings, but that was so sensational that I can't even think of anything else. Um, the, uh, one, of the, one of the problems, it seems like, in government and, and in Illinois is that there are all these different government bodies. There are just a tremendous number of government bodies that have this ability to tax, and, uh, and uh, people are just getting nickel and dime. They're, the government's not being run well because there's no, uh, it's just hard to even keep track of all these, of, of what everybody's doing. Uh, they're running everything into debt. They're passing the, the buck on to people. One example is um, uh, the, uh, the Illinois Commerce Commission approved uh, um, uh, people's gas. They're replacing all the gas pipe, and uh, and it was a poorly there was a poor it was poorly managed for a long time, and now they're they're claiming that they need to replace all the pipe. They're going to pass that on to everybody. So now it looks like on the average everybody's bill has gone up 75 bucks a year, but they're worried that in about 10 or 15 years people are going to be paying 400 bucks a year. Now for anybody uh, who has a soul, they understand there are a lot of people in Chicago that if you go to them you say, you got to pay us 200 bucks a year, not for the gas, just for the pipe that we replaced. It's going to push them out into the street. And, and this is an example of how there are so all these different organizations and people just can't keep track of it. And, and so, uh, uh, when somebody comes to is looking to run for the, uh, the water reclamation district, I'm I'm all for it. Somebody who wants to go in and cut corruption, and uh, and I and I wish you the best. Um, there's one thing that I would uh, uh, take exception to is you made a comment that uh, you were telling friends to trying to get them concerned about global warming and saying that Chicago will be tropical soon. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure if you really meant that or not, but that's just not really the case. I mean, you, people aren't going to see massive increases in temperature, in world temperatures. It's in their lifetime anyway. That's not really the problem. The problem is these tiny, for us, tiny incremental changes in the average world temperature, which isn't going to make it, is going to mean nothing to our comfort. It's not going to affect the kind of clothing we buy. But climatologists will tell you this will make a massive change to the climate, to the world climate. And some of the things we're seeing is we're seeing uh, more, uh, uh, a, a lot more of these serious weather events. We're seeing uh, uh, the, the farmers are hurting because there are long spells where it's dry and then all of a sudden the crops are flooded out. In the winter, it can make a difference because it's actually making the, the um, uh, the, uh, uh, what, what is the, um, road salt? No, it's that high, the, the jet stream. It's making the jet stream more unstable. So the jet stream moves weather, uh, weather systems, and, and for our area, it can move weather systems from the Arctic down to us. So 
you're going to see uh, uh, more uh, variations in winter weather and, and climate, and, um, and it, it can have a, a really big impact as well as the rising seas and the effect on the coastal area. So just wanted to make that correction. Thanks. Thanks for talking. Yeah. I listen to your talk with much interest, and I thank you for coming. However, I'm in serious doubt as to your qualifications to be the Water Reclamation District Board member. Number one, you talk a great deal about sterogenics. Now, no one is happier than I to see them gone, gone, gone. But what's that got to do with the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District? They don't regulate air pollution, period. Second, you don't seem to have any understanding of how Chicago disposes of its sewage. I learned about that when I was in grade and in high school. As part of a high school class I, in Evanston, Illinois, where I was then living and then a student, we toured the scope of Northside Sewage Treatment Works. And later, with, the, with a group from the Field Museum, we toured the Stickney plant. And I've also toured the Jardine Water Filtration Plant. I mean, this is basic stuff that everybody should know, not just candidates for the board. And so, I'm, and in view of the fact that Cam Davis, who was elected as an independent to the Water Reclamation District Board in the last election, and is now running for a full term as there, I question very seriously your qualifications and those of the Green Party candidates for the board. Secondly, you seem to harp on the fact that the Democratic Party follows Green Party ideas. These ideas are not trademarked, they're not copyrighted, and the Democratic Party did the same thing to the Socialist Party years ago. How do you think we got Social Security? The Socialists labored long and hard to try and get it through, but it wasn't until the Democratic Party stepped in during the Great Depression that they finally got it through Congress, and that President Roosevelt signed it. Uh, we might not have Social Security or an eight-hour day or any of the other New Deal reforms without that. So, I'm sorry, I don't take a dim view of the Democratic Party borrowing other people's ideas. That's how stuff gets done. Thank you. Oh, one more thing. Some of us are backing Joe Biden in, in the primary. Thank you. Yes. Stealing stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Troy, for an excellent presentation. Uh, one of the programs that I watch to unplug from the corporate media, especially in election years, is uh, right here in Chicago. It's called This Is Hell Radio Interview with Chuck Mertz on SoundCloud. And I'd just like to uh, mention some local, uh, recent episodes that I think are really relevant to tonight's uh, presentation. Uh, Episode 1071 Network was in August of last year, 2019, way beyond the Democratic Party on the Green New Deal and why it must happen and what must happen next. And episode 1102, the future of energy and the Green New Deal. Episode 1107, mass surveillance and social regulation, powering a world we want, democratic energy and the Green New Deal. Uh, Episode 1007, Rising Signs in June of 2018, Rise and Retreat, Climate Change Washes Across the New Shoreline. Uh, episode 1014, Red into Green, that's from July of 2018, Saving the Planet is a Working Class Job, the Case for Eco-Socialist Transformation. Episode 1038, Last Call, January of 2019, Worse Than You Can Imagine Why Climate Realism Requires quiet Climate Radicalism. And uh, that's just a few that uh, I suggest. Uh, those in global positions of wealth, power, influence, and status must lose a lot of sleep asking themselves the question, why do everyday people keep showing up? Uh, why do everyday communities keep living our lives, working towards our dreams, giving our all? Can't we finally throw in the towel? Don't we know about mediocrity? Can't we surrender to imperialist rule? Haven't we studied the fine art of half-assing it? Didn't history teach us that if you can't beat them, join them? And corporate-minded human beings who spend a lot of their time in Washington, D.C., 
do it better than anybody. They just coast through time without accomplishing any legitimate outcomes whatsoever, no matter how many great examples exist as precisely the answers to so many of the challenges that they so loudly proclaim their unwavering commitment towards solving. We the people's time, trust, and taxes are too precious, too fragile, and too crucial to our quality of life to surrender to a system of corporate thieves, corporate murderers, corporate surveyors, corporate polluters, and who every election drag out an embarrassingly costly, tired, business as usual, familiar carnival of cronyism, gradualism, and low expectations, cynically browbeating us not to make the unthinkable error of demanding that our values be at the very core of writing policy, condescendingly warning us not to make the perfect the enemy of the good. Uh, this year, Illinoisans in his district uh, choose somebody that, yes, he's not perfect, and that's why we respect him even more, because he admits it. He's the best we've got. Support Troy. Who's <laughs> next? If there was one thing or one bit of advice that I would give you tonight, that would be to join a local Toastmasters club. Yay. Okay. I say this uh, to enhance your speaking ability. Obviously, you kind of know what you're talking about on a lot of things, but you needed to stick on point the issues of why you're running for the MWRD. You had a lot of extraneous information about yourself that could have been cut way back and way down. Um, I heard a couple of people outside saying that you're too interested in yourself rather than the issues that are there. No, I'm just saying that was based on the presentation we saw. So I'm not trying to you do it, but that's the impression that you gave some of the people here. If yes, it you is really true. want to get success in the political realm, oh, it's out of the you really need to um, get more on point. Uh, I think that just some basic training in the art of, of present presentations with your stuff may benefit you immensely. I'm not going to say anything more about it, but I'm just going to simply say this. There are tons of Toastmasters clubs in the area. I have seen a lot of people like you utterly transformed in less than two years or so to becoming a lot better on point, a lot more succinct, and a lot more stage time. One of the keys to becoming really good at speaking is a practice of the craft. You should be out talking more about this. And if you're going for the MWRD, learn what they do and their issues. Not just corruption, but like I said, the basics of the infrastructure. I've not been to Stickney, I've not been to Jardines, but I did tour Elgin's water and sewer plant. It was less than about a five hour commitment of time, but it really educated me as to what really happens with the water and the sewer, and then on top of it, the electric that comes in. And if any of you ever realized some of the infrastructure that comes in behind this stuff, you'll understand why we have some big government agencies and why certain things do not can't be privatized like water and sewer. Um, for me, I am a Republican. I like private enterprise, but I do think that some things are better left, like you said, with the incentives of, you know, the public good. I will say one more thing, and that is, uh, I want you to take my advice, not as a put down, but as a way to improve yourself. Um, and I'm not, 
I'm not doing a very good job myself in evaluating you as far as your presentation is concerned, except by the fact that I think you will benefit immensely from Toastmasters training. Thank you. That's a personal attack. Yeah. <laughs> personal attack. Yeah. It wasn't personal. No, it was. I was a suggestions yeah. for improvement, I think. Here. One of the reasons that I asked the questions that I did, uh, you're an unknown running in a little known, uh, for a little known office, probably with very little in the way of sponsorship. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm one of these people, and I, I come from a family of political operatives. I don't know about you, but my feeling is if you're going to go into a battle, you go in to win. How you do that depends on the situation. Uh, if I wanted to be a totally pure man, I would have become a monk. Uh, the fact of the matter is, do you want to win? How bad do you want it? You find a sponsor. You find an organization that will back you. Uh, you find people, and that's why I ask, what are you doing for the people in, in your community? Make friends. These are the guys that will do uh, the door ringing and the pounding, and there's a lot of that work that needs to be done. It's very unglamorous type of work, but you don't win unless you do it. And regardless of your party label, uh, unless you go into it with the idea that you are into it to win, not to make a statement. If you want to make a statement, you come here to Bug House Square or to uh, uh, the College of Complexes. Uh, but if you seriously, if you seriously want to have an impact, you get with an organization that can do things for you. You get with sponsors that can do things for you. And no, you're not going to get everything at once. It's better to get half a loaf this year. Next year, you get two thirds of a loaf. Then you get the whole loaf. It takes a while. It's the nature of politics uh, in the American way. And it's worked very well for uh, the past 250 years or so. So uh, anyway, just some thoughts and uh, good luck. All right. Guys, a full of advice. You <laughs> heard yeah, a lot of advice. Person. Yeah, I'm going to tell you guys how to First. do what to do. All kinds of things got advice. I'm going to try to keep it brief because uh, we're our speaker will have the last word. I assume somebody might be going after me for a rebuttal, but if not, our speaker will have the last word. Um, our speaker and I talked a lot about uh, corruption and various politics, and he's absolutely right. In Sunday school, if you can remember back that far, for those of us that went, we were taught that there's good and evil in the world. Well, we're seeing it right now all over the place in spades. Albert Einstein said that the human race is in a race between education and extinction, and I'm not sure which side is winning. <laughs> well, right now, we're seeing a spectacle, basically, of predators versus humans. The predators on one side are the billionaires that run the fossil fuel industry, the pharmaceutical industry, and the military-industrial complex. Collectively, they form the largest killing apparatus the human race has ever seen. I gotta shut this off. Ralph Nader said, uh, we saw the empire fight back this last week. Joe Biden was lagging in the polls and his career was essentially over until the establishment got behind him and uh, shifted the vote tolls in a bunch of states, depressed the vote, closed voting polls, had long lines in areas where they were going to vote for Bernie. And so uh, they came out on, after Super Tuesday, they announced Bernie had this giant comeback. 
and corporate corporate media are doing everything they can to suppress Bernie's candidate. It's not Democrats or Republicans. It's corporate predators versus people that want a living planet. Period. For those of you that would like to understand what's happening in the Trump administration and the people that support him, I highly recommend getting this new book called Losing Reality by Robert J. Lifton. He's a longtime writer, uh, one of the most you know, skilled, credible psychiatrists and writers describing um, how people become, how, how people come to believe in pure myth. And, uh, you know, back in 1983, the Reagan administration had a man that said, there's no problem with nuclear war as long as everybody has his own shovel and can dig his own foxhole. Robert J. Lifton and the others, the doctors, called that an example of insanity on the hoof. Prime beef, as it were. <laughs> well, um, lately, one article showed up on Common Dreams about a week ago. Uh, a journalist said, I forget, it might have been Jamie O'Neill. Anyway, he said, journalists, reporters, uh, analysts are having trouble finding words to describe Trump because nobody alive has ever seen a creature like him masquerading as our president or masquerading as the commander in chief. Can you imagine people that wore the uniform, still wear the uniform, took the oath to defend America, having this guy at the top masquerading as the commander in chief? I say Trump has the same thing in common as Joe the Plumber. If you put Joe the Plumber in charge of the surgery department at Mount Sinai, uh, would you want to be operated on by Joe the Plumber since because he had the money to buy the office? Well, that's where we are with Trump. He said, Trump, there's, he violates all seven, he, he expresses all seven of the deadly sins all day, every day. Trump, Trump is not an incompetent politician or a criminal or a buffoon. He's evil. He's the essence of evil. And uh, he's appointing people that have no ethics, no morals, and no conscience. It's like they hung a sign over the White House. If you have no ethics, morals, and conscience, come on down. We got a job for you. And if, if you're in the Republican Party and you want to help the American people, you want to curtail pollution a little bit here and there, you want to make people's lives a little better, we'll remove you in the next primary. We don't like your kind here. Just like Alice Restaurant, you know, if any of you remember that, he's sitting on the bench and the sergeant says, we don't like your kind. <laughs> and uh, this is where we are. And the, the country is going through what I call the Catholic Church moment. There was a while back in big Catholic churches, if you went into the church on Sunday and said, oh, by the way, Father O'Malley's been a month blessing your kids for the last 12 years, half of that congregation would say, get the hell out of here. You're slandering the man. That can't be true, so I'm not going to look at the evidence. Mine's just closed. Until the other half said, if a shred of this is true, we have an obligation, legal, moral, and ethical, to examine the evidence and do something about this problem. Well. We have, the scientists are overwhelmingly in agreement. It's 99.9% .9 of climate science now. It's not 97% to 3%. It's virtually, virtually 100% of scientific bodies all over the world say, look at the pictures of the ice melting at the South Pole and North Pole in Greenland. We got pictures from the space shuttle and everywhere else. This is not a hoax. It's happening. We got 10 years to get off fossil fuel or it's over for the kids that are going to try to live much past 2050 on, on a livable planet. There, there, you know, nobody's saying the human race is going, going to go extinct by 2030. What they're saying is our, our opportunity to do anything about this, the window of our opportunity closes no later than 2030, probably sooner. We have to get rid of Trump and get a Green New Deal started. They're calling it the Green Deal in Europe, incidentally, going solar. And for those of you that don't know, new houses and other places, gas furnaces and gas pipe are being outlawed for new construction because solar and wind power is now cheaper than gas or any kind of fossil fuel for heating buildings. So there's a green revolution going on that our press, and one final note, he talked about why wasn't that in the press? So they didn't cover it. Well, I would highly suggest if you haven't seen the book Censored News, get a copy or log on to Project Censored's website because 
what he talked about, no press coverage, is the definition of media blackouts. Corporations don't cover things that uh, are going to excite people to get up and make a difference. Okay? There's, and also, for every billionaire, there's a few thousand of us. We outnumber those predators like thousands to one, but we're sitting back not doing anything about it temporarily. Bernie and his campaign and other progressives, there are some progressive men and women that got elected. They're risking their lives. They're getting death threats talking about giving everybody affordable health care. That's what's going on. We're, we're in a battle for the, the soul of America, and it's predators versus humanity, good versus evil. And the sooner we recognize it and get through the Catholic Church moment and step through the psychological barrier and actually look at the evidence, we can all move forward on the same page and move toward a clean, green future. Thank you. Okay, let's thank our speaker one more time. And wish him the very best. Um, in the campaign and the other candidates for the of the Illinois Green Party. I see you guys you good thing you come to the college you get all kinds of expert advice, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you listen to these idiots and show but you wouldn't win anything. <laughs> you can you can take him off the ballot. Uh, well, I'm gonna pick on uh, all right, I'm gonna go to a few things eclectically. First I'm gonna pick on my friend Joe. Henry George is the economist from 1900, basically out of date, um, <laughs> focused on land, but it doesn't make much sense anymore with uh, agri business and corporations, the multinational corporations aren't locked down anywhere uh, in the planet. Transportation has changed. And I'm sorry, I don't think Henry George, I like the Henry George people and the school and so forth, but I don't believe as an economic theory it's relevant anymore. Also, uh, Joe, uh, we're facing global climate change, but you don't want to have national, you, you, you want to have local climate control. Why, if we're having global change, we need, we need these topics to be talked about at the global level, the highest levels, the most in You've got to have treaties in covering all 200 countries of the earth, not just my neighborhood. And well, well, that doesn't do, you need national oh, policy governing all 50 you states. But you're libertarian, yeah, yeah well, I'll come back then. All right, you can present it, but no. Uh, it's it's in, it's it requires international cooperation uh, to stop it all uh, in this regard. Uh, the other thing you're entirely correct about nonprofits. I know pretty much how nonprofits operate. They're on the take uh, to pay for uh, various positions as they mature into organizations that have expenses. Uh, there are ways of financing them by public, uh, the public agencies. Um, I've been in one that we were renegated, and we were renegades and, and don't take any of that corporate stipend. I, I honestly, I, I know all about those in the organizations you're talking about. I think I was even told, Charlie, I was in, involved in one nonprofit in particular, told them, Charlie, we're not gonna ever give you nothing. You know, because you, you just make our lives too difficult. Oh, uh, the other thing is, uh, last of all, um, I like this hair of these guys. You guys you guys took a tour of a plant, and now you're experts on no, this, you know? I mean, I went through the, I was thinking about this. I love you guys. I mean, I went through the Ford Company plant, and they made automobiles in Dearborn, Michigan. But when I, at the end of the door, I didn't become an, I'm not an auto mechanic. <laughs> this, is, this is the, so now here, I draw this is because you took the tour. And then you think it's a school group, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, the school lobby. 
makes you an expert on water. So Why not? The, from no doubt qualified to run for office for water reclamation districts, you know. But anyhow, thanks a lot. Come back and let's see what, what's going on with the Greens in the campaign. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. Experts. Oh, by the way, Toastmasters. So I'm, I'm new to this format, so uh, I think this is my rebuttal to the rebuttals. Closing comment? Is that Correct. Right? Correct. All right, so. You've got about seven minutes or less. I wasn't just, uh, you know, sending text messages on my phone. I was taking notes. Um, uh, sterogenics, so I brought up the sterogenics thing uh, as, as an uh, example of how um, the media covers some things and doesn't cover other things, and especially w with regards to environmental justice. So I apologize if the talk was a little disjointed, but um, you know I came here to talk about the MWRD and then my colleagues weren't able to make it, so I took it as an opportunity to give you a broader vision or of my understanding of what I've experienced in these last decade of trying to affect some change in the city. And what I found was that the nonprofit industrial complex, just uh, much like the military industrial complex, uh, is sort of this unseen force in national politics. Chicago is the home of organizing uh, nationally. And uh, I think if you want to understand Chicago politics, you've really got to understand that nonprofit industrial complex, how it works and intersects. And inter interacts with the media and corporations and politicians. Um, so that's what I was going after there. And I appreciate you uh, humoring me. Um, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of questioning my qualifications, I would argue that uh, some of my opponents are less qualified. Uh, that's why they're uh, stealing my ideas. Um, which you know, I, again, I consider that a win if they if they implement them. Uh, stealing ideas, you know, it's frustrating. It's nice to have people take your ideas and elaborate on them, uh, but when it goes unsighted, uh, what you're doing is you're rewarding plagiarism. And the reason we don't allow students to plagiarize in high school or college or anywhere is because we want, it, we want them to think. And if they're not the ones who are coming up with thoughts, then, uh, you know, what are they? They're just copying. And maybe we should reward people who are independent thinkers, who are coming up with new ideas. And that's why it's important not to just say, like, ah, I just stole it, it's fine, no big deal. Um, you know, it's nice that the, it gets implemented, but it's not, it, the credit should go to where it's due. And that's how advancements are made in science, and that's how I think advancements yeah. are going to be made in public policy. Um, I appreciate uh, somebody speaking about values at the core of our policy, and that's what we really want to enact, is having values at the core of our policy. Toastmasters. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I'm not the best public speaker. I'm OK with that. Uh, I, I will give a, a shot at and, and, uh, and very serious. Uh, attending the Toastmasters uh, speaking conventions or, or meetings, whatever they are. Um, you know, I came up, I, I'm an academic, so I'm used to presenting technical talks, hence the, the PowerPoint slides. Um, my method of communicating is I've, I've tried to bring down some of the technicalness, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, technicalities, I should say, but um, it, it's a work in progress. And, you know, what I found from teaching Calc 2, I taught three semesters in a row Calc 2 as a teaching assistant. The first time going through, it was terrible. Second time going through the, the semester, got a little better. By the third time, I could you know walk in half asleep and knock it out. And so this is uh, my second time presenting that second half of the, the talk here. So again, it's still a work in progress, and I appreciate your uh, patience with me of painting this pastiche of Chicago's nonprofit industrial complex. Um, extraneous info, too interested in myself. Uh, as Somebody who's the first in my family to get a college degree. I'm very proud of my college Good. degrees, and I'm not going to apologize for no. that. I think it's important to you know that uh, I'm qualified. I think every good team needs a statistician. At least that's what uh, NIH grants, uh, National Institute of Health grants require. Mm -hmm. National Science Foundation, many of them require statisticians. We don't have one on the commission. Uh, I am not a water engineer. I have not taken the 
the four hour tour. Uh, but I, I think I do have something to add there, and it's clear that I do, given that my less qualified opponents are taking my ideas and painting them as their own. Um, big government agencies. I, yeah, there is a place for big government. Uh, you need coordinated response to things. Uh, this, is, this is why we have a military. Uh, it's hard. It, we can't all just grab pitchforks and, and guns and, and, and fight, uh, I don't know, the barbarian invasion whenever that happens. Um, you know, getting the, the fight to win, uh, I'm, uh, I'm wrapping up here. So finding a sponsor, get with an org. This is why I've joined the Green Party. Uh, this is most closely aligned with my values and kind of been kicked out of the Democratic Party, or they excuse me from it. Um, military industrial complex. Uh, the Green Revolution, Project Censored, window is closing. Uh, yeah, our window is closing. So uh, somebody mentioned that, um, yeah, we're not going to be a tropical climate, but actually, uh, the worst case scenarios that I saw in 2008 at uh, Berkeley's, uh, the IPCC, are now the real trends that we're with. So I think given you know, 2040, 2050, uh, I, I would not be surprised if we got in a climate like Alabama. Um, criticisms, I, you know, I wouldn't get into politics. If I uh, couldn't take criticism, I appreciate the, the, the critiques and the, the feedback. And uh, I want to thank you all for having me, and I hope you'll support our campaign. Thank you. Yeah. Give him a shout, Andy. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we're adjourned for tonight. We'll see you next Saturday. We're out.